Hello and welcome to Back of the Net and Beyond, where today I'm going to be speaking to former Arsenal, Man City and Sunderland and also Ireland international footballer, Niall Quinn. How are you doing, Niall? Are you okay? Great, Danny. Yeah, thanks for getting in touch. No problem at all. Thanks for coming on. Um, so, I mean, how's life treating you at the moment? Well, we're in lockdown here in Ireland. We were in it for two weeks before you guys in England. So it's, uh, it's been long, but I think we're getting the rewards from it. Uh, the numbers are looking much better now in terms of people passing away, unfortunately, people contracting the disease, etc. So we're looking at the next phase of, of leaving lockdown, as not totally leaving lockdown, but the hope is that the next measures will uh, give us a bit more freedom. But it's, um, it's been a very sobering process, I think, for everybody whether you're connected to people who've, who've lost people or, yeah. uh, or even if you're just reading the newspapers, I think we've all been uh, re-evaluating ourselves ever since. Yeah, definitely. It's always, um, I mean, a situation like this has made people, like you say, re-evaluate the situation in terms of obviously their life and development going forward. It's also made yeah. people adapt in certain ways as well. Um, certain things that you may have thought were important, may, maybe not so much anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, like I said, thanks for coming on. Um, if you want to just let people know what you're doing nowadays in terms of your day-to-day -day life. Sure, okay. So uh, long long past the day when I was a footballer, I've, I've morphed into a couple of things, but where I've actually ended up and landed on lately, I am the, uh, I'm the executive chairman of three small tech companies. So that's uh, going to bore the head off you when I start talking about them, Danny, but uh, that's just a different uh, area of life that I got into over the last few years. Okay. And I also have one leg still stuck back in football. I'm an interim deputy CEO of the Irish Football Association, the FAI, which is, um, you know, I suppose a, a kind of labor of love that was thrust upon me given the circumstances the association here found itself in. Mm -hmm. And having been an advocator of, a uh, better way and a better pathway forward for our association. I was thrust in and uh, alongside Gary Owens, who's the deputy CEO and uh, the new independent chairman, Roy Barrett, a part of a team that has, uh, is charged with restructuring the association to have a, have a different outlook and a different, I suppose, end product to make yeah. football better for everybody in the country. So that, that's that been a, a challenge. I, I was given a six month interim period. I've, we've covered about four and a half months, I would say, and uh, most of that through lockdown. So it's been, wow. been quite incredible. So I've, I've been living on Zoom, probably, <laughs> is the best way of putting it. But we're getting lots of stuff done. And I think at a time like this, it's amazing how the, uh, how the meetings multiply and how you can get a lot more done, yeah. I think, in terms of giving people tasks and then coming back with the answers in the next meeting, as opposed to, you know, I suppose the driving into work every day, driving out to meetings, the social side that you, you don't have. Yeah. So I suppose rigidly we're, we're getting a lot of work done on that and, and we're hoping to uh, strategically announce major improvements and major changes by the time we our, our contract bows out uh, at the end of July. So it's, a lot, it's, a, it's, it's a, lot, you know, a lot going on. Mm. Uh, to give you an idea, that there are, there are four main areas, I think, football-wise, in our association. We have our grassroots. Mm -hmm. and schools, school boys, school girls, and uh, where, where that leads to into the amateur game. So we, we, we call that grassroots. It's the mm -hmm. next step up then for talented players to come into a high performance unit. And effectively, we have what's called national leagues here that are um, subdivisions of the, of the League of Ireland clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, one or two leagues who, who have come in on that also, regional leagues. And then from there, the, the, the League of Ireland, which is our you know, domestic elite program, we have our international uh, structure then following that and we've just made announcements on that. Stephen Kenny has become the new manager of Ireland um, yeah. taking over from Mick McCarthy. So from, from bottom to top, there's been an awful lot going on. There's a lot of difficulties in the meantime and we have big financial issues at the association. Nobody realised the, the hole it was in. So we, we kind of come in at a difficult time. But, you know, at, at, at a time of disruption like this, uh, I think it's concentrated minds very well and we're, we're making good progress and we hope to have a, a you know, a, a pretty decent restructure in place for whoever takes it going forward. Um, I think that's important. So, so some key elements there that, you know, honesty, yeah. transparency, you know, that, um, that people can trust how the association works from now on in all areas. So, so that's been really busy. And mm -hmm. to give you an idea of that, I'm on 14 subcommittees. 
Wow. We were all very active during COVID-19. Goes from all of those areas, from League of Ireland right down to grassroots and the international. So, so it's being a challenge. We've also corporate governance issues yeah. that we have to overcome and, and financial reform and procurement. It's been, uh, it's been everything thrown at us over a number of months, but it's starting to make sense. I think. So that's, that's on one side of it. And, and on the tech side, then we, we, we've um, three startups and one of them doing well in profit, got itself going nicely, two of them about to take the plunge into the marketplace. So I, I've been very busy. Well, it sounds like, um, I mean, you've got a lot going on then. I do want to touch on, on that a bit later on as well. Um, and it seems like you've adapted well, obviously, to the, the given given the circumstances that we're in. And you mentioned that you're on Zoom quite a lot, and I think everyone is. Uh, I mean, prior to the lockdown, I, I wasn't even aware of Zoom. Uh, <laughs> Me so too. It really has taken off. And I mean, like you said, um, aside from the obvious where you've got no physical contact with someone in a meeting, it, you can be more productive uh, online uh, with these kind of Zoom conversations and other platforms that you can have these conversations on. And in some ways, you can get a lot more done. Um, yeah. And it seems like you, like you said, you've, you've adapted really well. Um, mm. In terms of your career, I mean, again, for the average layman, I'm aware of your career just because I'm from a football background, but many people are. Um, for me, you've had a, a, an amazing career and you've played for some amazing teams. Um, and again, you were a really good player as well. Um, in terms of um, your book, um, there's a quote from yourself in there. Um, and it goes something along the lines of, um, I learned my trade at Arsenal, became a footballer at Man City, but Sunderland got under my skin. I love Sunderland. Um, <laughs> it's a great quote. Um, can yeah. you just elaborate a little bit on that and maybe explain sure. what you mean? Yeah, I suppose I went over very raw, 16, about to turn 17, went to live with my auntie and uncle in London. Huge change for me. They looked after me really well. Mm -hmm. And as I started to make a little bit of progress, uh, because I lived in Twickenham, which was the wrong side of the city for to, for, to be going into Arsenal every day, mm -hmm. I eventually moved over and went into Diggs um, near Southgate. Mm -hmm. And so as, as that sort of journey took, took place, things were, were, were very difficult for me at the start. There was the best centre forward in England, Scotland and, and Wales to deal with. And, and I was kind of late coming to it. I hadn't played schoolboy football for Ireland. Mm. Uh, when I think about it, it's so much easier than today when I suppose a young lad from Ireland going over to Arsenal to make it as a centre forward. Suddenly he's got to beat kids from all over the world. He's got to be better than, yeah. than guys from every continent. Whereas I, I really only had to be better than guys from the British Isles at the time. Mm. And so that, started, that journey started to get a bit better for me uh, when, when Don Hell took over as manager. Um, he, he, was, uh, he, he was pretty good to me. He believed in me and showed some faith uh, yeah. in me. He had, he had a, a coach um, called Alan Cartwright who uh, also believed in me and they decided to play with a tall striker, which they hadn't done for some years under Terry Neal. They had had Charlie Nicholas, Tony Woodcock. But yeah. they bought Paul Mariner, which was important. And I was then seen as somebody who'd come in and maybe be an understudy to Paul Mariner. And, and that was huge for me. So I then went and got a new contract. Okay. I uh, got my first pro contract, which was great. And I made my debut then because Tony Woodcock and Paul Mariner got injured. Mm -hmm. So you do need luck. You know, those two yeah, guys definitely. got injured on a Thursday and a Friday. I mean, I, I, I was heading to Port Vale on a train on Thursday after training. Wow. Um, John Rudge, the Port Vale manager, was meeting me at Stoke Station. And I was hoping to play in what then the third division yeah. uh, on the Saturday to make my debut for Port Vale. But when I got to Stoke... Because there was no mobile phones then or, or WhatsApps, I was told to turn around that there'd been an injury in training and for cover, I had to go back to Arsenal. And I went back on the Thursday evening, went into training on Friday, learned that Paul Mariner had been injured. And then on the Friday, Tony Woodcock got injured. Jesus. And I made my debut on the Saturday. <laughs> and I, I'll, I'll never forget the team, the, the squad, because the squad had been printed up in the, with the typewriter in the secretary's office. And uh, Tony Woodcock's name was scribbled out and my name in ink was down at the bottom end, Quinn. Jeez. And so I, I, I was delighted. I didn't think I'd play because there was yeah. other players yeah. there and they could have switched around. But I wasn't really that nervous. And it was only, we, we, in them days, we tried to, you know, the, first of all, you'd meet at 11 o'clock in the morning for some matches, home matches, and have breakfast and videos. But at that particular time, Don Howe was bringing us in a quarter to two. Okay. Kick off at three, turn up a quarter to two. And, and that, that, that's hard to believe now. Still, like, you know, it was a massive game. It was Liverpool, the champions. And uh, they hadn't been beaten in about 16 weeks, and um, we were on a bad patch. 
and we had a full house at Highbury and I, I kind of got the train in, I read the Irish papers. I got a bit of a fright when I read the Irish papers because I bought them at Finsbury Park News Station mm. and it said, oh, Quinn might make debut. And that was, I thought, Jesus, I don't think I will, but, you know, getting a bit, a wee bit nervous. And then when we got in and he named the team and uh, I had not time. See, I slept well because I didn't, you know, I wasn't worried. Yeah. And uh, everything was fine until I went out for the warm-up. Mm. And I started looking at Ian Rush, Kenny Dalglish, <laughs> Jan Mulby, Mark Lawrenson, Alan Hansen, Bruce Grobler, yeah. Ronnie Whelan, all these fabulous players. And I can remember, like everybody else was doing their warm-up, and I was like, oh my God, I'm hearing the same pitch as all these guys. <laughs> yeah. that, that was the way it was for the first 10 minutes until yeah. Steve Nichol hit me an unbelievable elbow into the side of the face as we went for a header, and that was it then. I woke up then and started fighting my corner. Yeah. And I ended up scoring on the day, scored on my debut, Nice. And so on the Sunday morning, I was on the back page of all the tabloids. That was the only, as you know, communication with fans in those days with newspapers the next day. It was uh, some sort of a, of a, of a hero. And uh, I should have been up in Port Vale. So it was, uh, that, that's how I started. So, so when I say I learned my trade, that was an important time for me. And I, I finished out the rest of the season in the team. And uh, we, we did okay. Charlie Nicholas came alive, did, worked well. He scored some goals playing with me that he hadn't been scoring. Team did okay, but eventually Don was replaced then that summer, just before the, the season ended. Yeah. And um, George Graham came in. Okay. And George, okay. as you know, was a serious taskmaster. Yeah. And I have to say, you know, and I've met him since, you know, to thank him for a lot of things. His discipline was incredible. And his, his the, the desire and his, his devout attention to detail about how we uh, prepared ourselves as a team, tactically, etc., physically. And so we had a really strong defensive team, very famous, as you know, the, the famous back four at, at yeah, Arsenal, yeah. O'Leary, Adams, Bowles, all these people, Dixon, went for an incredible stuff. And uh, I was part of that for a couple of years. The first year under George, I played every week. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed it. I think I got 12 goals. It was a decent return for a kid. Uh, but then Alan Smith came. Yeah. And uh, so, so right way through my progress, one of the finest target men ever to play the game came in and, and George, you know, bolstered the squad by bringing him in and so I was his understudy mm -hmm. and um, so much so you know that, that I, I ended up still being his understudy when I was at Sky and he started working for Sky I was nearly his substitute again but when he was a player Alan God be good to him but he never got a yellow card and he oh, never got yeah. injured and he never got injured so very seldom would I get a chance to shine and at the start at that time there was only one sub allowed onto the pitch but then it became two a year afterwards but that was the that was the most it was. So my chances were limited, but I was learning so much. And the Irish thing started to take off for me. George Graham started to pick me. Okay. Sorry, uh, as George Graham started to pick me, Jack Charlton picked me. Yeah. And so, so life started to look better. And then that Irish team started to come good. And uh, we qualified for Euro 88. And uh, even though I was in the doldrums, I was, I was brought to, to uh, Germany for Euro 88. I played against England, which was, was a great thrill. I came on with, with half an hour to go. Uh, we beat England one nil right out and scored these, you know, big monumental times in Irish football at, at the time. And then we we went on to qualify for the World Cup in 1990, and I scored in, in a World Cup match against Holland. So, so my career in that period, 88 to 90, was 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 great internationally. But I was understudy to Alan, yeah, and found it really difficult. And even though we won the league in Anfield, I think I'd played three games, or and I'd scored in one of them, and I, I made an important contribution. They they didn't give me a medal; they gave me a silver tray. Instead oh, of a medal, which we still have, um, it's actually in use now in the house. <laughs> but um, that was my that was my lot. And as all the players were then going to kick on and win a second title and win in Europe, and that whole squad were getting together, I had to leave then for football's sake, really, because I, I'd done two and a half, three years. Yeah. As an understudy, I was managing to hold on to my place in the Irish team. The World Cup was coming up, mm. and uh, I was delighted then that George Graham allowed me to sign for Man City in March 1990, which was just before the World Cup. Uh, we were in the bottom three, things weren't looking good, uh, but we got going and I scored a few goals and the team started to gel and we finished quite strong. We finished 14th. I think we lost our last game. Had we won our last game, we'd have finished ahead of United that season. Okay. We finished 12th. So they hadn't got going either under yeah. Alex Ferguson. Yeah. He was under serious pressure. Yeah. And so uh, I went away to that World Cup. Uh, I, I sort of felt better. Harold Kendall really believed in me. He was fantastic for me. And the World Cup went very well. and. My following year at Man City was my best year in football. I scored, I think I got 22 goals. Mm -hmm. uh, I also scored some good goals for Ireland. And I, I, just, I just was at the peak, I think. You know, I was um, probably about 26 years of age, something like that. Or 24, 25 years of age. And 
and, and I then felt I was becoming a, the footballer that, that was in me. Mm -hmm. So when I was learning the trade at Arsenal, I became a footballer. It was that time where I, where I evolved and developed and felt great about wearing number nine for Man City yeah. as opposed to being yeah. really worried wearing number 12 for Arsenal. Mm -hmm. We had to wear mm -hmm. subs at all number 12 and then there. Yeah. So my career got better and, and I scored a good few goals. It was going really well till I got a cruciate injury uh, three years later. Um, you know, we, we'd had two very good years, one under Howard Kendall, two under Peter Reid. We'd finished fifth twice, mm -hmm. but it, it didn't register as success because United had really started to fire down. Yeah. So when your local yeah. rivals are winning all around them, it was difficult. And we found it difficult to beat them in any match, you know, never mind the league or, or you know, trying to get cups or whatever. So it was, it was um, around the time then that Francis Lee took over from uh, Peter Swales as the owner of Manchester City. And I was really hoping that I was going to be part of the new re regime and it was all going to go places. I was in the prime of my career. And I suffered a cruciate injury against Sheffield Wednesday. Mm. Which, um, which knocked the, the, the life out of me. Me, me. means I missed the 1994 World Cup uh, and struggled to get back. And I didn't really do myself justice. There's always bits of problems. But I got going again um, yeah. to a point where Peter Reid then wanted to sign me. He, he'd had me at Man City because he became the manager. He wanted to bring me up to Sunderland. City were, were happy to let me go because I wasn't the, the fifth roaring 23-year-old that walked in the door. Yeah. I was a kind yeah. of a struggling 28-year-old uh, with a cruciate injury that still hadn't overcome properly. But Peter believed in me, and, and my repayment to Peter when I went up to Sunderland was I got injured after five games, I did the other cruciate. So I was, his, I was his record signing, and I'm sure the whole of Sunderland were looking at me, this, this lad has come up, and it's like, look, it's unfortunate. But I was really desperate to, to kind of prove it to them. And they were quite tough. Sunderland fans were tough in, in those days. Here was this star coming along, injured all the time. Um, and I tried to come back, and I tried to come back too early. I came back four months and two weeks after my operation to play in a derby against Newcastle, which looking back now is crazy. Never mind uh, 20 years ago, whenever it was, yeah. um, 25 years ago, when, when maybe you know medical knowledge wasn't what it is today. So uh, that was a struggle for me. And I played poorly, and Sunderland ended up going down on the last day and down at Wimbledon. We, could, we didn't beat Wimbledon. Um, Again, I played that one again, but I was on one leg. Mm. Went away in the summer, had a bit of a washout of my knee, had a go again the start of the next season, wasn't happening at all. Crowd were really tough on me. Um, and I was very close. I'd, I'd received forms from the PFA telling me how I quit. My wife was heavily pregnant with our second child. Yeah. And uh, I, was, I was all over the place, really. And a, a man called Mr. Bollin uh, had a little look at my leg I'd had my two cruciate options, I had my left one, my right one, and this was a, a, he said, I think there might be something different wrong, it mightn't be your cruciate at all. He was in Bradford, he was a great man, and uh, I went to see him, and he, and he said he'd do it. I went away, and he said, I'll do it now if you want, and literally, without telling the club, without doing anything, I had another little look into my knee, mm. and bingo, it worked. And I came back, and then a very, and then a very important thing, two important things happened. One, Kevin Phillips walked in the door, yeah. nobody knew who he was, and everybody yeah. questioned, why, why have we signed this fella? And I felt like I was ready to, to, to be strong again and to, and to be, you know, I suppose, top of my game again. And, and, and that, there was two, two big things there. And Peter Reid believed in me, I have to say that. Mm. And then suddenly the goals started to come, the association with Kev started to come, the, the wingers I played with, uh, Alan Johnson and Nicky Summerby. I mean, it was a dream to play with those guys. They played to my strengths. Um, Bobby Saxon, our coach, centred a game around Kev and I, how we get position for, uh, possession further up the pitch, how our... Players like Lee Clark would support that, how our wide players would do it. And um, we, we, we had a, a way of playing which clubs just found it really difficult to play against. And we were scoring lots of goals. It was exciting for the fans. And then came that came the best period of my career. Yeah. And maybe it's because I, I cherished it so much because I was coming to the end. Yeah, of course. As opposed to when I was at Arsenal and scoring on your debut against Liverpool. Yeah, I have a few drinks that night. Everything yeah. good. Yeah. But suddenly it meant so much more to me. So I, I, was, I was heavily invested in Sunderland. And... I turned the people around, and that was that was a great feeling because ask anyone who's played up there, you know, it's a tough place to play. They they don't suffer fools, uh, but if you give everything you've got in the locker, yeah, they, they're yeah. on your side. And and I realised that so much that you know, as I started to do that and things started to come off, I built up this great relationship with the fans, and they knew what they were getting from me on the pitch. And then uh, I also knew I had people around me, the, the Phillips and the. Some of these, as I said, Kevin Ball, what an inspirational leader to have. Mm -hmm. I suppose, Danny, what I'm saying, you know, all the other Tommy Sorensen, the guys at the back, everyone, 
but you know, Steve Bowe came, Jody Craddock, these were great players, Darren Williams. You know, there was a there was a connection in the dressing room, Sunderland, yeah. that I'd never witnessed before. Mm. You know, it was a great time for the Northeast as well. When I say a great time for the Northeast, you know, the commerce looked to be going much better. The economy looked to be in good shape. The Prime Minister was from my local village in Sedgefield. Uh, one of his main supporters and right-hand men, David Miliband, was up the road. You know, Mo Molan was nearby. All these inspirational people in politics were there. And the region felt as if it was coming out of its doldrums with the closure yeah. of coal, coal industry and the shipbuilding. Um, Newcastle had a top team. I, I can say it now. <laughs> yeah. Newcastle, Newcastle were brilliant. They were qualifying for Champions League every year. Keegan nearly won the league with them. Yeah. Middlesbrough were qualifying for cup finals, you know, and uh, they had the Brazilian influence, they had the Italian influence, you know, um, Brian Robson was doing great things there. We were doing our bit. We were all punching in the top half of the Premier League. When we were playing derbies, they were incredible games because it was the difference of us getting in maybe to Europe as opposed to further down the league or even playing them in the championship. Yeah. So that all was good. Newcastle Falcons had a great rugby team. There was a great ice hockey team in play up there at the time. And the whole thing just felt like it was a great place to be. The timing was perfect. Our jobs were plentiful. And the, the fun around derby time, the buzz, the, the electricity in the, in the air for a week or two leading up to derby. I'd never witnessed that. I'd done Sunderland. Sorry, I'd done uh, Arsenal, Tottenham. Yeah. Big yeah. occasions. And they are big occasions. I'm not belittling them. Yeah. But then I, 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 you know, I'd done Man United, Man City. Huge stuff in, in the city. But when, when you think about it up at Sunderland, Newcastle, because they're not winning trophies, this becomes the trophy. Mm. And the fact that it affects every house in the city tells you about what it's doing to you around you. Each day in the build-up to it, you went to the petrol station. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, you go, you, you just, it's incredible. Um, whereas in London, maybe half the population might not even know Arsenal were playing top. So, 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 so you're surrounded by this sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like a bubble that you can't get out of. And yeah. that's what the, the Derby's were. And of course, the Derby's went well for us. You know, Kevin Phillips and I had a good time. We won a couple of derbies back to back up in Newcastle. I mean, that was huge. They still, you know, the hair goes up on, on, on my neck when I start thinking about those days. And so when I say I loved it, it got under my skin, I loved it. I, I did because, and I, I'm not the only one who says it, but all allowed to say it was the best dressing room I was ever in. The yeah. time was great up there. The people really loved us, trusted us, believed in us. And we were also closer to the people. You know, we, we didn't have big earphones on yeah. to put on if fans were walking by so we didn't have to look at them. Mm. and sign autographs you know we were willingly signing autographs we were willingly going for a pint locally um peter reed was great he understood that the value of having a team a close-knit team brilliant dressing room and that if they went out they went out together but that you know you you, you would, i was kind of given the task of making sure everyone got home safe but, yeah. but we always ensure that we, we didn't go to nightclubs that was a big thing we go to pubs and there you'd meet people who were genuinely pleased to see you yeah and you didn't mind buying buying pints of bitter you know, uh, instead of being, being flash in nightclubs, buying champagne. I think that's where the, the, the thing really started to gel and people really liked seeing us. Nowadays, you get people getting photographed and getting outed for, for looking at a drink, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. It was a totally different time. We, we had a fabulous connection as a team to the fans and I just, I just know the fun we had, everything. I just wanted to hold on to it. And, and I, to this day, you know, I spoke to Paul Butler the other day and we just say, can't explain it to people. There was just nothing like it. Yeah. And, and hence, that's why, you know, when, when, I, when I try to be honest about my career, Arsenal was a great, fabulous club, and I'm so proud that I was part of it for a short while. And I think I played 92 games. And that's a different stats every now and then that are out there. Uh, I got 20-odd 20 goal, 20 goals in those games. Um, I'm proud of that. I was a part of the Arsenal story. I was there the night the trophy was won in, in incredible circumstances at Anfield in 1989. Uh, as you know, Hillsborough just happened, so everything was delayed. It was the most emotional time you could think of. Mm. And to snatch it from Liverpool was, was very cruel. The outside world all wanted Liverpool to win, and, and, and I get that, and of course they should, but, but we, we, we snatched it at the end, and it was the most traumatic time. So to have been around for all that mm. was great, um, but then to go off on my own journey, you know, and, and, and the Man City part of it, I said I did become a footballer there. You know, I did believe that I belonged in this echelon yeah. when I got and and Sunderland was different. Sunderland was a bit of a crusade. <laughs> I mean, it's a short great. answer. A short answer yeah. to your question. No, I love that. I love the way you've gone into detail. I mean, it, like you've explained how you've evolved as a player, going from club to club, and that's kind of what I wanted to hear. Um, because without obviously speaking to you, no one's really going to know that um, yeah. unless they're there to experience that with you. So that's what I'm trying to grasp. 
Um, you mentioned some amazing players there. Um, the one that played with the Sunderland, and obviously at Arsenal as well. Um, in terms of Kevin Phillips, I want to hone in on that just because I can remember the relationship you had with him on the pitch and the goals you scored and like the, the positions you used to get yourself into. And it seemed like you had great understanding on the pitch. Do you want to just explain like how that came about? Was it just natural or was it did you practice it? Well, well Bobby Saxon was instrumental in making the team understand that nobody can beat us if we have a good diagonal ball and everybody's able to respond and know what's happening. Mm. So as a diagonal ball, let's say it comes from an advanced fullback coming over the halfway line, plays a diagonal ball to say where I am on the far side. That takes out a lot of players from the equation. I was good at getting hold of that diagonal ball. I'd have the left winger coming in behind me so that I could flick on to. I'd have Lee Clark maybe just behind that I could drop it down to. Yeah. Or I had Kevin Phillips, who, who had this fabulous task, uh, this knack of being able to judge, you know, where to run in a split instance, a second or two going one way to shift the defender to run the other. And I knew that was happening. So as soon as the ball comes, I could see in the corner of my eye, he was moving right. I know that means he wants it left. He was, his pace would always get him onto it. And yeah. if, that, if that wasn't the case, then I had the other winger, Alan Johnson, if it was on that side, or Nicky Summerby on the other. They would all either maybe come inside, expect a knockdown. All different. We had different ranges all the time. So it wasn't mm. just kick and boot and get after it. There was three or four phases around it, which meant we were getting the ball into wide areas or into areas around the edge of the box. Mm. And then he started putting them in out with the outside of his foot into the top corner, you know, bending them around and yeah. tipping goalkeepers. He just, it started to happen for him. Mm. And, and I promise you, we did not go too, through it in too much detail on training. Okay. In fact, you wouldn't want to be on Kev's team in training because he'd want to get all the goals and he'd want to keep the goal. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> But it, but it worked lovely for us, and, and um, I, I was, you know, I was, I'll always say Kevin added an extra three years onto my career. And there were really? three great years. Yeah, because, um, you know, if you can remember, and it's been, it's, it's come out a lot, actually, in lockdown, I've seen a couple of programs, Kev is still the only player to win the European Golden Boot. And mm -hmm. to remember now of all the players here in this country who, who had the chance to do that, so no other player here has done it. Um, he, he did it with Sunderland. Mm. You know, and that that's um that's that's saying something. It wasn't with you know Man United or it wasn't with Arsenal or Liverpool yeah. or Man City. And and I think um that 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 that's you know, whatever happens, hopefully somebody does it, you know, as soon as football comes back. But I think for Kev, that's fitting testimony to somebody who had been let go as a footballer at Southampton, mm. um, told he wasn't good enough as a fullback, went to Baldock Town, where Ian Allenson, my former Arsenal player, who played the day I made my debut, my former Arsenal colleague, was mm. his manager. And got sold for buttons, for crumbs to, to Watford. And uh, by his own admission, wasn't pulling up trees at Watford. Mm. But Graeme Taylor offered him instead of David Connolly to Peter what? Reed. Peter Reed inquired about David Connolly. I spoke to Peter Reed about this and uh, he said, I have another kid who I don't have a lot of room for. I think he might just do it for you. Mm. And how right Graeme Taylor was. It was a um, shrewd signing by, by Peter Reed. Yeah brought to his attention by Graeme Taylor and once Kevin I mean it was amazing he came in the door of the Charlie Hurley training centre and the second he came in the door you could say this guy is different he wants it badly mm. you know other people come in and they're a bit of shy of what's going on around them yeah. uh, other, other people are kind of take a while to settle in he was off and you could see he just had this desire to, to be one step ahead and uh, he joined in in the dressing room straight away he became an integral part of it and it's, it's a pleasure every time I see him now or I hear him or watch him on the telly. I, I just, you know, I, I don't need to speak to him all the time. There's just, a, there's a bond yeah. there. And the other players as well with Buzzer and all the other lads, Buzzer, Summerby, uh, Paul Butler, all these lads, Boldy. We, we don't meet or speak or say, we'll have to have a reunion soon, I guess. But, but that, that, it was a really special time. And, and just, yeah. just look at Kev's goals, you know. Ridiculous. Um, it's ridiculous, yeah. I think yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. So to be there for when all that was happening um, yeah. was wonderful. But without Kevin Phillips, I'm not sure where we'd have gone. <laughs> ah, that's amazing. Um, obviously, you played for Ireland uh, for a long period of time. Uh, what was it like to represent the country and playing the World Cup? We brought into the squad first as a memory I'll always cherish. Uh, there was no mobile phones in them days. The club had got a letter to say I was to turn up at a hotel in Dublin. Mm. And I'd been in the under-21s a bit, so I was used to getting those letters for the under-21s. But when the one came, I was in the senior team. Mm. Uh, it was for a tournament, a summer tournament after the season ended in Iceland, uh, between Iceland, Czechoslovakia, as it was then, and ourselves. And um, I was thrilled. And I got to the airport hotel in Dublin. I was 
you know, delighted with myself. I had, I started to, I played a half a season with Arsenal. I'd had my, I got my, I copied Charlie Nichols with the Chris Waddle haircut. <laughs> if you remember, yeah. and I felt, wow, this is great. And I drove over from uh, Ireland. I got the boat and the ferry over from Hollyhead and I had my new, well, it wasn't new, it was 15 years old, but I had my Ford Capri with the Go Fast Stripes. Oh, and nice. Charlie <laughs> Nichols haircut. And I, yeah. I rocked up to the airport hotel for my first uh, meeting with the Irish team and queued up to check in. Jack Charlton was beside me and he lifted his glasses up and he looked over to Morris Setters and he said, we haven't picked this useless fella, have we, Morris? <laughs> and that, that was my, and I, and I panicked because I didn't know he was joking. Yeah. And then I thought, oh my God, the club have got it wrong. It must have been a letter for the 21s. Right. <laughs> but it was, amaz- it was an amazing bit of uh, psychology by him because he more or less said, well, we better have you. Seeing that you've turned up, we'll have to have you. Uh, be down for training at two o'clock. So I went up to my room going, Jesus, should I be here? I better show him why I should be here. Yeah. And I trained like a demon. I kicked Frank Stapleton. I kicked David O'Leary. I elbowed them all. Had he not done that, I'd have probably been looking at them saying, well, I'm, I'm here with Liam Brady. Or, yeah. and, uh, and they all laughed afterwards because he had fooled me. But, but that, was my, that was my introduction. And it was a part of another dressing room that was just, you know, to measure it. it, it, it we didn't meet every day of the week because we weren't, you know, like a club. Yeah. But when we got together, like lads would hide injuries, me included, to make sure you got in the trip because really? it was just it was a magic time. And, and it got to the point where I remember Peter Reid uh, insisting that because there was no breaks then for internationals. You, you played a match on a Saturday for your club. You went yeah. off and you played your international on a Wednesday. You got back to your club Thursday and you played again for your club on Saturday. And yeah. uh, I can remember at one point Peter Reid insisted on me wearing an Ireland jersey underneath my Man City jersey. And then later at Sunderland, because he reckoned I worked harder in an Ireland jersey. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so they were a great time. Jack had us in a great place. Mick McCarthy followed on when I got more out of it later on. Um, and, and of course, the, the pride and joy of playing for the country, everybody would tell you, there's nothing like it. Yeah. And for someone like me who had gone to the matches in Lansdowne, you see, we had no floodlights, Danny, in Ireland. So the, oh. so the Lansdowne Road World Cup matches had to take place, particularly the winter ones, yeah. at one o'clock in the afternoon. Right. And we were in school, so how do we get off school? You don't. You've got to try and pull a sickie or whatever. Yeah. So we used to do these things to go to these matches when, you know, when great players like Michel Platini were coming with France. And, mm. you know, I think of any of the world players that were around at the time. And, uh, and I was jumping off school to get into the terraces to stand there saying, one day that could be me, you know, as everybody in the crowd was. And, uh, and it, it came true for me. And, and that, that's just a feeling that, is, is, is kind of half unexplainable, but you, you know, you know, you've been there as a footballer. When those highs start, um, it, it, it's hard to measure it properly and tell people exactly how it is, but it's something that in underneath everything, you, you, you derive great satisfaction. Amazing. Um, and you've got an MBE, so, I mean, tell us about that. How, how did that come about and how did you feel when you got um, the information that you were getting one? Well, I, I told you um, Tony Blair was our local MP in Sedgefield and Mo Molum uh, was by uh, David Milliman, and they were working really hard on the peace process. Mm. And, you know, as we know, most people doubted whether that could ever happen, me in, me in particular. Uh, Bertie Ahern was the teacher at our end. Uh, I got a testimonial awarded to me by the club, which I, I felt I didn't deserve because I need, you need to be 10 years at a club, but in exceptional circumstances, you could be awarded a testimonial. And I was awarded that by uh, Bob Murray at Sunderland mm-hmm. um, for bits and pieces I'd done with the foundation and other stuff. And I didn't feel it was appropriate. So, um, and, and also because I wasn't 10 years at the club, I would have had to have paid uh, 40% tax on right. anything that came in. And I so, said, you know, do I really want to go into that and ask fans to dig deep just for me? Mm. Um, when other players won't have been 10 years at the club, will it have been seven years at the club mm. or eight years at the club? And I, and I said, no, do you know what? I'll, I'll just turn that into a charity game. And I said no more about it. Asked, uh, Sunderland, if they would be okay with that, Bob Murray said he would. Then I, I asked the FAI at the time, would they would they take part in that? They said they would. Mm-hmm. And unbeknownst to me, it leaked to the newspapers, and it, w- it went a bit crazy. I had no committee, I had nothing arranged for a game, okay. and the big output because I was the first player to uh, donate the proceeds of his testimonial, entire proceeds. Right. Now I put real pressure on those coming after me. I hadn't even stopped to think about that, uh, who, who probably were deserving of one after ten years, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I was in a funny position, but lo and behold, as it was as the story broke, um, on the one day Tony Blair at Question Time in Parliament spoke about it. So it was on News at Ten. It was on every 
it started to go global. And uh, on the same day, Bertie Ahern spoke in the Irish Parliament. It was all about it. So there was no going back then. And I had to have this game. And thankfully, the game went, went really well. We had uh, 35,000 people came on the night. But more importantly, this will tell you about the power of football. More importantly than those 35,000, I say that knowing how the sacrifice these people made. Uh, I got a letter a month or so before the, uh, two months before the match, after it had been announced from a prisoner. Uh, a, prison, a guy in prison who was serving a long stretch in prison and spoke about his life and how he had uh, made some bad decisions. But notice what I had done. And even though he couldn't attend because he was in prison, would there be any way I could send him a non-attendance ticket with a match program? And he'd saved up a tenner and he sent me the postal order for the tenner. For the ticket. Wow. And I went to, if you remember, Barclays were heavily involved at the league at the time, Premier yeah. League. And I went, Barclays were, their call centre was based in Sunderland. I still is and I went to see the head guy up there to say could we maybe get some people to, uh, to man the phones and we go out there to other people who can't attend but this is before you know the internet or anything like yeah. that this people phone in and we might get some publicity for it and maybe sell some extra tickets for those who can't attend but who would like a programme mm. and we sold another 35,000 of them Jesus so, so in effect, we had nearly 70,000 people paid to be at the game. And we, you know, and we didn't charge too much. Uh, but what we did manage to do was, was get uh, in excess of a million pounds for the night. The whole thing went into a, into a place that no one could have envisaged at all. Um, so, and very quickly then, uh, the, uh, the, the, the peace process, as it was gaining momentum, both Bertie Ahern and uh, Tony Blair said they would be privileged if on behalf of... Uh, my family that I joined in and made some kind of effort to link what's happening in Ireland and England. I was respected by both sides of the community, so I was happy to do that. Mm -hmm. And my mother and my my sister, or sorry, my mother and my wife were very strong in uh, in getting me to say yes because you're a little bit reluctant. You know, I grew up at a time in Dublin when you know the hunger strikes were on, yeah, uh, the black flags out their windows in my estate where I grew up, and there was a very anti-British feeling. But um, but a lot of people had moved far more than me, people who'd suffered far, far more. I hadn't suffered at all. Yeah. And when, it, when, it, when I weighed it all up, you know, given the, the importance at the time, now this was before the Good Friday Agreement was announced, mm -hmm. uh, it felt the appropriate thing to do, so I did it. Now, I, I, at the time, I, I worried, but I have absolutely no regrets now, and I think what, what, what happened then, the likes, particularly Mo Molan, you know, somebody who passed away not long afterwards because mm -hmm. of cancer. Uh, I can't tell you... Um, how big Mo Molum is in my eyes and what she did for our country, country that she had no need to do anything for. Mm. She's from Middlesbrough, you know, and she went and uh, she brought both sides together. Tony Blair did his, did his piece, Bertie Ahern, there were others who did it. Yeah. Um, Albert Reynolds was instrumental as well, our former Taoiseach. There was a whole host of people. And um, I, so, I, so I, don't, I don't feel bad at all. I may have worried at the start that I took an MBE, but I'm, I'm delighted. Now, I didn't go to the palace, thought that was a stretch too far. Uh, the British ambassador in, in Dublin said I could go to his house up the mountains and get it from him. And my mates brought me to the palace afterwards, which was the name of a bar in Fleet Street in Dublin. And we had a big day in the palace in Fleet Street. Right. And we danced, we danced on the tables and all sorts. And, um, so that was my MBE. And that's the story I'm going to tell Nice. Yeah, but I don't, I don't go shouting it out too much, but now that you brought it up, yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I wasn't expecting to hear that story. Um, you assume when someone's got an MBE, they, they go through the, I don't know, in, in inverted commas, correct channels and end up meeting the Queen of the Palace and stuff. But, I mean, to get it off the back of uh, a client gesture, that must be an amazing feeling. Um, so, yeah, thanks for sharing that. In terms of, um, as I mentioned to you before, the reasons for me, um, obviously, doing a podcast, speaking to former athletes, current athletes, um, and figures within sport, um, is basically to make people aware that athletes do have transferable skills, which are suited to other industries. And from both um, sectors, I think athletes need to be more aware. Some of them may not even be aware that they've got those skills. And if they have got those skills and they are aware, they may not know how to showcase them to aid them getting a job or fulfilling a uh, business idea that they may have going forward and again industry leaders and organizations may not be as aware as they can be just because the information is not readily available um, so in terms of your retirement process um, 
how did that come into the uh, the picture for you? And what was the process yeah. behind it? The reason? Did you get any help? Um, do you think more help's needed? Me personally, I do. Um, just because football, sport in general, is, is massive uh, worldwide. But I don't think there's a lot of support for former athletes when it comes to retirement. Yeah, you, you're bracketed. And uh, I, learned, I learned really from my mistakes. Mm. And what I'd say to you is, you know, in the, the run-up to my retirement, uh, I had decided to, to join Peter Reid on the coaching staff at Sutherland and I was going to ease out of my career and become a coach mm. and it all was pretty straightforward. Peter gave me a contract uh, to do that and Peter got sacked six games later. Mm. Howard Wilkinson came in who said he didn't want me and he'd asked me to stay quiet because the fans like me and I'll let you have a move in a couple of weeks down the leagues and I got really frustrated with this. My wife is Irish. We'd always planned to come back to Ireland. We'd bought a site in Ireland to build on. Mm. And I literally went home one day and said, that's it, we're, we're, we're up in stumps. We're going back to Ireland. Wow. The Celtic Tiger was in full flow. I had no idea what I was going to do, but uh, there'll be something there. And, uh, and, and let's go back. And, and it took a little while. I did leave. I did quit. Mm. Uh, I, I never played. I played a half a game or I came on with 20 minutes to go in, his, in, in Harold Winston's first game because there was a 10-day gap by the time he came to the first game and I didn't train with him once. Mm. I, I wasn't even training with the kids. He allowed me train with the injured player if I wanted to stay fit. And I did that two or three of the days, but most of the time I was just disillusioned trying to work out what to do next. Yeah. And I ended up anyway. I came on a sub from play quite well. He tried to talk me back into coming to have something to do with the team afterwards and I didn't. I went home and on the Monday we were making plans to go to Hollyhead for the last time. Yeah. But, uh, Julian had a horse truck and we were putting all our belongings into a horse truck and we were back. And, and that, 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 I'm sorry to, to, to inform you this because um, it was dreadful when I look back. That was the sole uh, input of my planning process for my transition to retirement mm -hmm. and it was dreadful. But what I've learned in the meantime, because I went through a, poor, a bad year or so, mm -hmm. uh, then I got going again and then, you know, Sky TV brought me back. Jeff Shreves kept ringing me, come and do a game, come and do a game. Yeah. And for about eight months, I didn't. And I, at one stage, I got as far as going out to, to the airport in Dublin yeah. and turned around and told my wife that the flight was delayed. I was like, I can't. Mm. And she kind of knew I was fib. And I just didn't want to take on the football world again. Um, yeah. Yeah. But eventually, I, I went and Jeff and, and people at Sky looked after me brilliantly. And I found a, a role for myself and I eased into it. I was lucky. I could talk, I suppose. Mm. And that whole experience started to happen for me between 2003. I quit in October 2002. So, so maybe from the summer of 2003 onwards, you know, I, I started to have a routine again. It was in and around football that I loved. And, uh, you know, I was, I was also making new friends here in Ireland. So I was, I was flying over and back. Um, then, then, you know, I, I kind of, where, where my mojo really started to fire was when, Bob Murray came to me at Sunderland and said the club was in trouble and could I help him find a buyer? And that's when it got a really life change for me then because I got a group together called the Drummerville Consortium. And not only did they want to do it, but they wanted to propel me into sort of the, the action guy, if you like, mm. of the group and to go and take this bit of scruff of the neck and to deliver it as a football person and they'd look after the business side. Mm. And that was a wonderful place for me because suddenly now I had to, there was an awful lot I had to learn about the business even before the takeover. Uh, and I was up every morning, I had real purpose. I was up sitting on my bed till four o'clock in the morning, learning how to deal with the Green Book of London yeah. rules on finance and corporate governance, et cetera. And mm. you know, I'd, I'd never been to a, a boardroom in my life, uh, you know, and I, and I had to learn an awful lot in a fast amount of time. But my yeah. purpose got rebooted, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And suddenly I was off and I, I'd found something and it worked and the guys went through with the deal and, and then Roy Keane came and the club got promoted back into the Premier League. So everything became successful. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and your energy is back again and your boxes are all ticked and you're, you, yeah. you're off. And then people start to say, oh, he knows a bit about something yeah. other, other than heading the ball. But yeah. I got there by luck. Okay. And then from that, I did more TV afterwards. And then I went into the tech businesses that I'm in. Yeah. Uh, now, listen, I've made lots of mistakes. I've, I've told you about the mistakes I made in other businesses that I entered. But that's, that's part and parcel of life. You can't get everything right. Yeah. Um, but, but truthfully, what I really want to say to you is if I was back now, I would look, listen and read as much as I can on what the experts are saying about this particular space. Mm. Uh, I read a fabulous um, piece by an American lady called um, Patricia Lally. And she's put a, she's put a, a thesis together about the, the, 
players in their transition of, of being an athlete to retirement, mm. that those who put the effort in find out what they're good at and yeah. use their time in football to find the perfect role for when they're finished, that those who do that actually perform better on the pitch. Yeah, because I was they talking know to someone recently yeah. about something similar to that, and um, they said essentially it's probably going to enhance your performance off the pitch because, well, on the pitch because you're not so worried about things off the pitch. Yeah, the anxiety and desperation leaves you, and so what what comes in is 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 a perfect pathway. It's a like it's I suppose it's like playing a lovely game of golf at the yeah. end with your mates, but actually you, you've got something else to go to when the last game of golf is over. Yeah. And I think we're, you know, you're playing in Augusta or whatever. I mean, you know, you can imagine what's, what, what I'm trying to compare this to. Mm. And so, so, so what, I've, what I've learned since, and I would advocate to all young footballers, to all young athletes of, of, of all sports, is use your time in this sport to pick the next 35 years of your life. Mm. You know, I think that's amazing. You, you might be 10 years at the top if you do well, but yeah. you're 35 to follow. And if you use those 10, finding out what you're good at, finding out what you're suited to, and working out what is it, and it's a very simple analogy I'll give you, what is it besides football that I jump out of bed for and go, yes, I'm doing that today. And all sports people have the choice to do that if they so wish. Mm. Clubs don't encourage it. Clubs yeah. just want you focused and zoned in yeah. to be what you are. And there's actually a negative feeling out there that it will take their, if they're not 100% on it and they're thinking about retirement, they're going to they're going to have a, a a lesser effect on the pitch. That's rubbish. Because Patricia Lally has proved it. She's took over a thousand athletes mm. and looked at it, timed it, sexually. She's got data that it's all there to show that you know a a, a suitably, I suppose, prepared athlete mm. for the next stage, which is ultimately the the, the, the main part of his life anyway. Yeah. Uh, he won't get lost in the in the grieving part because a lot of us get lost grieving for our career, and I did for a year. Okay. They, they miss out that grieving part because they're already jumping into something that they love and it becomes right. an easier time, that whole transition. And you and I know, but we find it hard sometimes to convince lay people uh, that, that we suffer when our career finishes, mm. you know? And um, it's, it's not one that there's a lot of sympathy out there for. No, oh, you've had your career, what are you on about? You know, but that, yeah. that's, that, that's, that's not, I mean, there's so much research going into that, as you know, mm. and a bit of you, you, you are grieving because a bit of you does die. Mm. You know, there's no, if I was to look back and say, undoubtedly, five days a week going into the dressing room at the Charlie Hurley training center for those last three, three years of my career, mm. that, that was like a child going to the circus every day. Mm. You know, it was just, oh my God, this is great. I can't wait to win and see the lads, the fun we're going to have. Yeah. Um, it was a grown up playground, mm. you know, where we had, and we were being paid a fortune and we were on TV and we were getting sponsored cars, and you, you name it. Mm. Right, when that ends, you kind of sit away, you think, well, people aren't talking about me anymore, I'm not getting the pat on the backs that I used to. Mm. That old manager's fault, it was all his fault. You know, you, 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 get, you start blaming everyone by yourself. Yeah. And, um, and I got into a very low place, and lots of people do, and, and the layperson doesn't understand that, but you do. Mm. And I wish that the, the players now who are in their prime, or even those coming up to their prime, that mm. they get this, understand it, study it, and yeah. have a pathway for themselves that will actually enhance their current, I suppose, certainly the psychology of what they're doing right now, but even the, the input and the impetus that, you know, their skill levels will, will, will be better because they'll be more relaxed. Mm. Their, their energy levels, everything will have them in a better place and a better frame of mind to get better performances. And that was, that's what this, that was the most interesting. I've read lots of things yeah. on this. Um, and Patricia Lally was, was the most prevalent, I felt, because this was the first person who had studied and got data to say that players would play better yeah. if they were prepared for the eventualities. And, and the eventualities aren't get ready to grieve, this is going to be terrible. This mm. is a great way of life just there ahead of you if you put a bit of work in now. Yeah. And I think that, and that sort of leads itself to, okay, well, what am I good at? What can I do? I, all I know is football. Mm. We, we should have, there, there are plenty of uh, companies and agencies out there who can you know, analyze each one of the sports people and mm. say, we're going to find out what you're good at. Mm. You don't know it yet. It could be something totally different. I mean, I, I've got a real kick out of being involved day to day in, in tech, in e-commerce and in cybersecurity. So had, had anyone told me that at 35, that at 50, you were going to be doing that, I'd have laughed out the door and said, go, go to the madhouse. Mm. But you know what? Just by trial and tribulation, 
I've mm-hmm. got there. I got a bit of luck along the way. I spoke about luck earlier on. Yeah. Uh, I had a little bit of luck along there, but but you know what? I, I jump out of bed now each day. Mm-hmm. And, and even the, the, the football stuff I've gone back into, the six-month uh, term that I took on this, it's, it's grueling hard work with lots of um, agitated constituencies in Irish football, and, and it's yeah. difficult to get it all together. But you know what? I, I'm, I'm almost going to bed thinking about it. I'm waking up thinking about it. Wow. Um, you, and, and that's the bit I'm saying, you jump out of bed. If yeah. you can find that in your life as a sportsman, and you yeah. know that there's something there that will make you do that, there are agencies who help you find that pathway. You know, it, it, it's, it's, the day is gone when you think it's all about just playing golf for the rest of your life, you know? Yeah, it's not obvious. Just, just <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I'll tell you now, I, if we'd had a really grueling pre-season, you know one of those gruelers where you've run all day and you've been yeah. running into the ground in the hot sun, you finish the last run, you're lying on the ground and you haven't moved to go near the dressing room or the car park for your year in about 20 minutes. You know that horrible time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you say to yourself, as you're drinking your fifth Gatorade, you say <laughs> to yourself, I can't wait for this all finish. I'm going to play golf every day. Mm. I'm going to do that. And, and, and all of us, all the footballers say something like that. Yeah. Right? And we get caught in that little trap that, oh, when this stops, mm. but this, this, when this stops, that's when it gets really interesting. And that's the way we should look at it and, and find out what your skills are. Be prepared. Mm. Now, other people confuse that with investing. You know, and, and there are wise guys out there who get you to invest in stuff that doesn't work. There are really good people who get you. It, it, that's fine. You're, you're betting your money that you earn. That's a different thing. Mm. What's, what's more important is you jumping out of bed every day from 35 to 65 and even longer, as we know, we're all going longer now. Yeah. And what, and what can I achieve uh, as my career is developing as an athlete uh, to help me in that path? Because it will also help me with my football or, or my athletics or whatever sport I'm, I'm involved in. And that message is not out there. And that's why I was really keen to come on yeah. and tell you all day long, take it from somebody who got there around the corners as opposed to straight through. I just wish I had spent my last five years being analysed, told what I was good at, would have yeah. got to a boardroom more quickly mm. and would have perhaps used my personality in a different way, particularly that first year or two after I quit. Yeah. That was, um, I was looking back now, I was a big hard lad at the time, I most certainly was grieving. I was grieving me. Poor yeah. me. I was a sad case, you know, and uh, a lot of us go through it, Danny, as you know. Um, and I would just say, if only somebody had got me to prepare differently. Yeah, I mean, thanks for sharing that. You made some amazing points there um, and really insightful. I mean, for me personally, um, I always say to people, there's no right or wrong way. Um, and I do agree with what you said in terms of maybe finding out what you're good at before you've retired. Then it, it kind of eases the process uh, when it comes to retirement. Um, and that's a great point. Um, but in terms of me, I'm assuming, well, I think now, after speaking to many different people about the subject, I'm one of the lucky ones because my transition was pretty seamless, to be honest. I stopped playing football and then I had about a month, two months rest just because I played a full season in England and I went to Iceland and played over there. So mentally and physically, I was tired. So I wanted to just rest and recuperate, still at a bit of a crossroads and wasn't sure whether to continue playing at the lower echelons of football or maybe find something else. And then I got offered a job. So I went for two interviews with the same company through normal channels, just the normal CV that I sent through and they, they offered me a position. So I didn't feel that rejection and I, I haven't had that. I hadn't had to go through that grieving process. So to hear other people's stories, like I said, there's no right or wrong. Uh, and I don't want all the stories to be like mine. So it's interesting to hear someone like you who's kind of had a massive career within the game, still well regarded within the game. Um, and I think probably for players or athletes like yourself who have maybe reached the higher levels of their chosen sport, it's probably harder to step away because, you, like you said, you lose that sense of identity people kind of still recognize you as maybe a footballer or that person used to do this and now they're doing this whereas with me i wasn't I'm, i've never been a household name so for me to step away was slightly easier yeah. well yeah i i appreciate that and and, and thank you for telling me that uh, i was because i was interested in how you how you dealt with all for something to happen quickly for you was great and you found your niche mm-hmm. and as you say you're one of the lucky ones but i would i would say for most players when the lights go out the the, the floodlights are dark and you're, you're on your own the adulation stops pat on the back isn't coming you know you do hit a low place and the higher you've gone you know the lower you kind of go i think in some ways yeah. and i would have seen over the years people who were even older than me so before i got on this cycle you know feeling that ah so i'm just getting on with things you know once i stop playing and and there's that period that i said you know that 
in people's lives just before they quit or maybe for a few years before they quit where that could have been arrested by a lot of people. So you're in the hope game after that. And, and I got lucky, you got lucky. But lots of guys haven't, you know? Yeah. And, um, that's why I would be very adamant that, you know, finding out those skills and finding the best way to use them in a transition to another, uh, another part of your life where you're, you're, you can feel just as, as proud and, and take in just as much, you know, positivity from what you do as you did when you were playing football that that's the key and it doesn't yeah. have to be scoring goals in front of the cameras you yeah. know or managing you know a top team and a lot of people who stay in football and there are more jobs in football now and i welcome that yeah but for those but for those who are kind of caught in limbo a little bit yeah. um i i do I, i'd really urge every player when you, even if even if you're getting to 35 and i know i'm talking about football more so than athletics now yeah. But get yourself on a course to discover who you are and what you should be doing when 35 comes. Yeah. Because it will help your current football. Patricia Lally's papers will tell you that. You should look them up. Yeah. Uh, and it will also obviously go a huge way to getting you on the right pathway so that you can then look back and get the most out of your career and enjoy with a smile what happened, yeah. not be fed up that it ended either prematurely or, or what have you. Yeah. And uh, I think there's a great way forward on that. And I do think clubs will listen a bit more than they used to in terms of players' needs to get on that pathway. I mean, there's player development officers, player welfare officers, as you know. Yeah. Those are going a long way to help to help players now. Um, I think, you know, a simplistic view of it would be get them to know what they're good at, get them to practice it before they finish, and get them so that when they do finish, they can do like you did, enter into a, a place of tranquility almost, where their career next step is something that they love, and this is great, I'm doing this. I wasn't I lucky, I did football as well. Mm -hmm. Me, that's the key. Brilliant. And before we finish, um, obviously you mentioned at the start, you kind of you've got your fingers in a lot of pies and you seem like you've got a real kind of sense of business. Um, what skills did you use, what transferable skills did you use from playing football to go into the various uh, like jobs that you're doing at the moment? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Well, because I, I was thrust straight in. I mean, imagine my first job in business was to be chairman of a club in the, in the football league which a year later got into the Premier League. So I had to learn fast. Mm. But that, the good thing about that was, the one thing I couldn't do was think I know it all. Mm. If, I, if I had said I know it all, it would have fallen apart. Yeah. What I was able to do, I, I, I fell right back to my instincts in a dressing room. Mm. The best dressing room I had. I had individuals who could do great things, but when they came together, they were fantastic. So what I, what I decided to do when I went in as chairman of someone who had some very talented people besides the football staff. Okay, so we talented... Uh, people in accounts, talented people in the legal department, ta talented people in ticketing, talented, really talented people in marketing, in com commercial, ex you know, you, you name it, top, top yeah. people. So who was I to come in off the football pitch and start telling them how to do their job? Mm. So my view was, I'll do what a good captain would have done. Good captain probably isn't the best player in the team at all, mm. but the good captain makes sure all the best players come out and do their stuff. Mm. And that's exactly how I treated it. And my skill was to bring people into a position where they felt good together. Yeah. Uh, I, and and I, did it, I did it the old-fashioned way. I wasn't there long at all. Uh, I, I, we, we took over in Sunderland. There was uh, just after being, I think, about 90 redundancies. Morale was really low. And uh, we took over. I, I took over. And one of the first things I did a couple of weeks in, I brought them all to Hexham Races in two, two big buses. Mm -hmm. And we went and had the day of all days up in Hexham Races. Sunny day, but like today here mm -hmm. in Dublin, which I don't say often. And... Uh, <laughs> And we had a fabulous day. We got to know each other, the bus and the way home. And we gave everybody a day off the next day to recover. We, it was great. And everybody came in with a smile on their faces. And, and that was the start. Mm. And, and my, my point to them was, I'm here. I'm here just to guide you all. Tell me where you want to go. You know, what is, what is it? Like one of the things I've learned, you know, if, if you go into, a, let's say, an area that's struggling, let's say ticket sales is struggling. Yeah. Okay. And you go into that area. What do I know about tickets? How am I going to sell more tickets? Mm. But what I could say was identify talented people in there and say to them, okay, what would you do if you were in charge here? Mm. And it was amazing what was coming back. The ideas started to flow. And when yeah. the ideas started to flow from other people who were cleverer than me, I was a conduit for getting it going. Yeah. Then, you, then you actually look good. People say, oh, your man's a good airman. Yeah. Actually, it was all of the, 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 the people coming together. Yeah. And the ideas started to bound out. And I gave them a say. And when people were going into work every day, they went from being afraid they were going to be made redundant in a club that had just been relegated, lowest points total ever in the Premier League, season ticket holders ringing up, screaming abuse down the phone at them. Yeah. Within months, 
they're now deciding the future. And, and we've got that, we got that dressing room together outside of the playing side. Mm -hmm. I didn't interfere too much with the playing side at all. I think Roy Dean, Ricky Sprague, yeah. Steve Bruce will tell you that. Um, and I, I think uh, it was huge. It was invaluable for me in everything I've done since. Even in, in, with, going in with the FAI now with Gary Owens, who's come in as CEO and myself, we're, we're, we're in there. No, we're at home in lockdown. But, yeah. you know, um, just seeing how good the staff in there are mm. who didn't get a chance to prosper and develop previously. Yeah. Um, we're going to come up with a restructure in the FAI. And it may, be, it may go down as something that came in in our time, but it will actually be our talented staff who will have delivered it. Right. And that's it. And, and that, I think that the role of, of somebody, you know, the skill set that I had in a dressing room, well, okay, I could do what I could do on a pitch, but there's far more skills than me, et cetera. But the role in the dressing room was pretty key. And I've transferred that into everything I do. I think team all the time. Like I'm on the committee in the local golf club. Right. And I'm still, I still think I'm in the dressing room. <laughs> you, you know? Um, and, and I still see that, like, okay, the, the vice captain is the right back. He's a great player, but, you know, he's got to come into the, to yeah. the, to the whole system. It, so, it sounds silly, but that, that was the one thing that, that I got out of football and, and that if businesses could only understand the power of having, imagine somebody far more talented than I with a better education than me that's coming out of a dressing room that's been through everything. Mm. Can you imagine what they would bring to a, to a restructuring of a business in terms of getting the best out of the others in your dressing room? I mean, it's a huge skill that I think, and, and footballers have the, they have the confidence, you know, and, and if that confidence was transferred into a different type of that skill set, yeah. you, know, you, know, you know how footballers are flamboyant, they can be, or yeah. if they can then retrain themselves up to do exactly that, but do it with, with, with I suppose, levels of uh, an education bit that comes in the middle, that gives yeah. them levels of ability mm. to upskill and upgrade everybody around them like good dressing rooms should be, then I, then I think it would be... Uh, it would be one that industry would look on very favorably. And, and I have found that, you know, when, when, when I, I've gone to meetings and I spoke of things or I've gone listening to things, people look at me and go, why'd you do all this? You played football. I went, I played football until I was 35. Yeah. You know, it, it ended overnight on me. You know, I'm 53 now. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, um, it's 18 years since, that, since I had that. And so, you know, I, I didn't set out and say, I'm going to redevelop myself. I'm going to have a rebirth. Mm. I just happened to get where my instincts brought me and where I felt comfortable. I felt comfortable telling people who had better skill sets than me to come back and show me how it's done. Really? And I'll get the kudos from the board ahead of me if this yeah. is good. So you can imagine the eight or nine different departments at the club yeah. at that time coming back in with the ideas of how they would do it, different to how it was done in the past. And, and then we'd look at it and get some expertise in around it to make sure that it was okay. Mm. Chairman can always bring a consultant in. And... Yeah. Uh, and then bring it back in, feed it through the board and the, and the investors who put the money in, and then we had this lovely flow. And I, and I learned so much in that. And had I not been part of a great dressing room in Sunderland, I wouldn't have known how to do it. Wow, brilliant. Um, I mean, that's really insightful. Uh, made some amazing points uh, throughout the conversation. Um, all I can say is thanks for your time today. Um, good luck in, obviously, uh, all your ventures going forward. I'm sure they'll be a success. Um, and like I said, thanks for coming on. Not at all. It's a pleasure for having me, Danny. And just remind, and remind everyone again, it's okay to fail. Yeah. You know, just, just as Brian Clough used to sing, pick yourself up, dust yourself down, and uh, get going again. That's it. We all, we all have to do that. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, hopefully, uh, speak soon again. Brilliant, Danny. Best of luck. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good luck. Bye.